doing a program. Yeah. We're gonna tell you. Can you stand for anything? Yeah. Just keep standing. Sure. Oh. Good evening. Welcome to the spring lecture of the Jesse Helm Center. Please, would you please rise for the invocation by Dr. Jim Somerville, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Elizabeth Doster. Let us pray. In the words of the prophet Micah, what does the Lord require of us but to do Doing a program? Yeah. We're going to tell you. Can you stand for anything? Yeah. Just keep standing. Sure. Oh. Good evening. Welcome to the spring lecture of the Jesse Helm Center. Please, would you please rise for the invocation by Dr. Jim Somerville, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Elizabeth Doster. Let us pray. In the words of the prophet Micah, what does the Lord require of us but to do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with you, God. He makes it sound so simple, as if it were a simple thing to know what is right and to do what is right, as if it were a simple thing to know when and how to be merciful. There are some who seem to have all the answers, who tell us in no uncertain terms what is right and what is wrong, what to do and what not to do. They come down on the side of justice, and they come down hard. There are others who come down just as hard on the side of mercy, who insist that loving the kind thing is no less important than doing the right thing, no less difficult, and often much more sure, which makes it difficult for us, and all the more imperative that we heed the prophet's summons to walk humbly with you, God. For only you can know beyond questioning the true meaning of justice or the true nature of mercy. So come and walk with us as we struggle with the issues, as we strive to be more humble, as we listen for your word. Teach us to do justice, to love kindness and to always, always walk humbly with you. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. On a beautiful spring evening, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Wingate University. I hope that before you leave tonight, you will take a few moments to walk around our campus. I assure you, you will be welcomed here by our students, our faculty, and our community residents who always look forward to these evenings with great excitement. We thank you for coming. Last week, there was a national story on the supposedly changed Jesse Helms. A reporter from the Winston-Salem Journal decided that our senator was no longer the firebrand he had once been labeled that he had somehow matured <laughs> and learned the art of compromise and developed new skills because of his position as chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee. While it certainly is nice to finally, after all of these years, begin reading positive newspaper articles about Jesse Helms, once again the press failed to get it. The 1999 model Jesse Helms is no different than the vintage ones. For all of his career, in fact, for all of his life, 
Jesse Helms has been known for his skill as a leader. The abilities we see so artfully implemented in these perilous days for international relations are the same ones he has always used in getting people to decide for what is right. His firmness and fairness are a legend among the fine men and women who have spent a portion of their careers on the Senator's staff before moving on to model his example in positions of leadership in businesses and public service across the region. His wisdom in knowing how to build support for what is right and when to turn sentiment into action is known and deeply respected among his peers. His unflinching devotion to the highest standards of morality and behavior are as solid today as they were when Senator Helms was simply Citizen Helms. So too is his habit for caring for people. Last year, Washington Magazine conducted a survey on Capitol Hill to select the best and worst legislators in a number of areas. The survey participants were the people behind the scenes, the ones who watch after the lights are turned off. To the shock of the often misinformed media, the staffer's almost unanimous pick for the kindest man in Congress was Senator Jesse Helms. Recently, my own family has seen that heart for kindness in action. So I am particularly able tonight to stand here before you and welcome home our favorite son, Wingate's favorite alumnus, my very dear friend, and a man who will always be remembered by our family and by many of you for his wisdom and his leadership, but admired most for his well-earned reputation for kindness. Senator Helms. Thank you very much. Dr. McGee, you always, being the friend that you are, so generous, and I thank you. I don't worry about the news media. They've been trying for 27 or 8 years to get me out of the Senate, and I'm still there. So it's sort of like uh, Sam Irvin, who once was not favored by the major papers in this state. He was worried about it one day, and, uh, and, a, and a town character in Morganton said, Sam said, don't believe anything the Charlotte Observer says. Said, they don't know nothing, and they got that tangled up. <laughs> but Jerry, you're a wonderful friend, a great educator, and a remarkable American. And I salute you, sir. Now let me do a little something for me, if you will permit me. Never before in appearing at these lecture series have I presumed to exercise even a moment of personal privilege, but I want to do it tonight. At this moment, on behalf of Dot Helms and our daughters and me, May I ask you to join me in standing for a quiet moment of thanksgiving for the life of one of the truly great ladies most of us have known and loved, if you will stand with me for just a moment. Thank you, God, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That wonderful Hannah McGee, whom we will miss forever, we have truly been touched by an angel. You may be seated. Now, you have, ladies and gentlemen, in your printed program this evening, many specifics regarding the achievements of Dr. Lloyd Ogilvie, who four years ago became the 61st chaplain of the United States Senate. Every senator who has served since 1994 can testify, far more eloquent than I, that Dr. Ogilvie is simply amazing. 
Part of it, yes, is his background. He came to the Senate after having served for more than two decades as pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Hollywood. He is recognized as one of the 12 most effective preachers in the English-speaking world. He has authored 44 books at last count and is a former host of the nationally broadcast television and radio, Let God Love You. Now, all of that's great, of course, and, but let me tell you briefly about another greatness of this man that does not appear in the biographical information about him. I have watched him ever since he came to the Senate, and I have never known a more genuine man than he, one who is sincerely interested in, who sincerely loves, who sincerely cares for people, young and old, in all stations of life. I watch him, for example, as he lovingly works with those bright little youngsters who serve as Senate pages. Like all the rest of us, those young people love Lord Ogilvy because he know, they know that he is special. Now, the lady with whom I have lived for the past 50 odd years attends his weekly Bible study sessions, as do many other Senate wives. And Dot Helms comes home every week with a greater love for and faith in our Heavenly Father, and that is a tribute to Lord Ogilvy. He has had these sessions for a substantial percentage of the 6,000 people, including senators, their staffs, and countless others. In the process of this ministry, he has exchanged many a smile, renewed many a faith, dried many a tear, and instilled in all of us a greater sense of personal responsibility. So if you sense that Dot Helms and I love this man, and his lovely wife, Mary Ann, Mary Jane. You are right. It is therefore my joy and my privilege to present him to you. Please, if you will, join in welcoming Dr. Lloyd Ogilvie. Jesse, what a wonderful introduction. It's a privilege to be here. We've had a wonderful day affirming the great leadership of Senator Jesse Helms, the groundbreaking for the Jesse Helms Center, and uh, the commitment to the future of the development of great leaders for our nation who share the values of Jesse Helms and his commitment to God and to America. So to have him introduce me uh, tonight means a great deal to me, and I'm very thankful. Weren't you pleased tonight to have that wonderful young woman uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, Elizabeth Doster? Why don't we just give her a hand? There's the future. Elizabeth, where are you? There you are. God bless you. When Jesse gave me that uh, wonderful introduction, it reminded me of a time when I was in uh, Darien, Connecticut, and where I was deeply gratified by the introduction tonight. I was filled with panic as I was introduced by this woman in Darien, Connecticut. She stood up and with egregious language, said, we have someone with us today who is going to change our lives. He's going to help us deal with our past and give us new hope for the future. He's going to fill us with self-esteem and a whole new understanding of our potential. This person is going to help us come to grips with life and it will be a life-changing experience. With that, I felt 
panicked inside. My hands started to sweat, and I had a, a, an ache in the back of my neck. There was no way I could fulfill that magnificent uh, introduction. And then she went on, if that hadn't been enough. And she said, as a matter of fact, the rivers of your life will be flowing in one direction and will stop and turn around and go in a whole new direction. And then she paused and smiled and said, this person's name is Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then as a throwaway line, she said, uh, and here's Lloyd Ogilvy to tell you about him. <laughs> I like that uh, because it certainly clarified my reason for being there and uh, would uh, reaffirm my reason for being here tonight. I'm so thankful to be part of this day. Nothing is more important. With it, life is sublime. Without it, it's constant stress. It's the secret of true greatness, the source of lasting happiness, the supply of wisdom beyond our understanding, the strength to endure in tough times, and the success in reaching what really counts. It's our ultimate goal, life's greatest privilege, and our most urgent need. What I'm talking about is something most of us find it very difficult to receive. It's not just facts or theories or ideas or carefully worded political promises. No one can give it to us or withhold it from us. It cannot be earned. It's the one thing that should demand our constant attention and be the primary purpose of our lives. It's of more value than the people of our lives, and yet with it, we can communicate love and affirmation and encouragement to those very people. It takes priority over any power that we will wield, any position that we'll achieve, and any portfolios that we will accumulate. Our nation is in grave trouble because of the lack of this quality. Lack of it accounts for the growth of moral and ethical relativism and the demise of absolutes in our society. The fabric of our values is torn and frayed because of the neglect of this privilege offered to us. It is the reason for which we were born, and it is the mission of our lives. What is this? The knowledge of God. Our purpose and our passion is to know God. Yet many people would admit that they do not know God. I've worked with leaders all through my ministry. And for 45 years, I've asked the question, what is the primary purpose, the driving force, the focus of your life? Seldom do I have a person say, to know God. Now, when I talk about the knowledge of God, I'm talking about something much more than simply facts about God or theories about Him. I'm not talking about a theological proposition. I'm talking about a relationship. For many, the absence of the knowledge of God is the cause of intellectual confusion, emotional turmoil, and physical tension. This deficit results in an abject loneliness that no person can relieve, an emptiness no amount of material success can fill and anxiety that no therapy or drug can heal. H.G. Wells said that civilization 
is in a race between education and catastrophe. I'm here tonight to tell you that I believe that we are in a race between the knowledge of God and catastrophe. Now, there's a reason that I've chosen to, spoke of this, to speak about this tonight. In caring for people, I have realized that with everything else that we have, very often the one essential reason for which we were born is neglected. But the Lord said to Israel in the 8th century B.C., reads like a line out of the Washington Post. And it's all the result of a lack of the knowledge of God. And listen to this from the fourth chapter of Hosea. By swearing and lying, killing and stealing and committing adultery, they break all restraint. There is no truth or mercy or knowledge of God in the land. My people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge of me. Leaf back to the second chapter of Hosea. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice and knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. But we combine that diagnosis with a very hopeful prognosis. Turn over to the wonderful, encouraging words from the 31st chapter, the 33rd and 34th verse of Jeremiah, when God gives this promise to you and to me and to our nation at this time of great need. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Nor, no longer will a man teach his neighbor, nor every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. So when our purpose becomes our priority and it's consistent with what is most important in God's mind for each of us, then life really becomes exciting. Now tonight I want to accept the alarming diagnosis of Hosea and the assuring prognosis of Jeremiah for God's intent for every one of us. And in analyzing what it really means to know God, I want to uh, analyze our culture and come to a deeper understanding of why it is that we are missing the one reason for which we were born. I'd like to suggest that uh, knowledge of God involves four things. There are four words that are the most misunderstood words in the American culture. They're words that we have wrenched from their etymological roots, and as a result, we are in serious trouble. First of all, the knowledge of God involves intimacy with God. Now, by intimacy, I'm not talking about sexual familiarity, nor am I talking about the quality of a relationship that was displayed for two long hours on television a few weeks ago in the evening. I'm talking about a different understanding of intimacy. The etymological background of the meaning of the word intimacy is proceeding from within, inward, internal. It's what Martin Buber would have called the thou-I relationship. An intimate relationship is when the real I meets the essential you. 
It's when any mask, any pretension, any faking or facsimile is torn from us and we come to God as we really are and meet him as he has revealed himself to be. Intimacy with God is an interpersonal relationship for which each of us was created. It's not memorizing a set of facts. It's coming into a dynamic, transforming relationship in which we dare to pray with the psalmist, Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. And then can go on to say, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way, any compulsive resistance in me and lead me in the way everlasting. For many of us, the practice of religion has not meant intimacy with God. Churchmanship has often evaded the essential relationship of an intimate relationship with God. I remember the challenge that I had putting on the front of a book conversation with God and a pathway to an intimate relationship with God and how hard it was to get that word intimate related to a relationship with God because we've denigrated the word to such an extent that we think of it only in terms of a sexual relationship of getting into the inner portion of the physiology of a person rather than a one-to-one, person-to-person relationship. See, dear friends, in Jesus Christ, God has torn open his heart. And he said to us, this is who I really am. In Christ, the revelation of the nature of God, we observe God as he is in his essential being. We see in him the unmerited, unchanging, (coughs) unqualified, unfettered grace that is his essential heart. We stand beneath the cross and we look into the heart of God. And we repeat with the poet, down beneath the shame and loss sinks the plummet of the cross. Never yet abyss was found deeper than his love could sound. Oh, I sometimes think about the cross and close my eyes to see the cruel nails and crown of thorns and Jesus crucified for me. But even could I see him die, I could but see a little part of that great love which, like a fire, is always burning in his heart. And in the revelation of Christ, we see the new creation that each of us was meant to be. Everything that Christ did and said and became, everything that he accomplished for us is so that you and I could become a riverbed for the flow of the very Spirit of God. The great need in our time is to go beyond religion and churchmanship to the dynamic power of an intimate relationship with God. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, O oh Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. 
Oh, here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. You see, when God's priorities become our essential purpose, then we understand the ninth chapter of Jeremiah, the 23rd and 24th verse. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him who glories glory in this, that he knows and understands me that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, mercy, and justice in the earth, for in such I take delight. And so out of an intimate relationship with God comes integrity. I was so proud to read in the inaugural speech of your president, of this college and university, the emphasis on integrity. Integrity in its very essential etymology means undivided wholeness, unimpaired completeness. Integrity is congruity of behavior, consistency between what we believe and what we do. There's a great need in our relativistic society for the kind of integrity where people do what they say and say what they believe and vote in consistency with the plumb line of the justice and righteousness of God and our society. Some may be surprised, but the Ten Commandments have not gone out of style. Nor has the Eleventh Commandment of Jesus that we ought to love as he has loved us. When we lose the basic absolutes of the commandments, society is set adrift. As G.K. Chesterton said, the one thing that can be empirically proven about the assertions of the Christian faith is that evil is real. But once you take away the authority and the absolute truth of the finite, of the infinite, in comparison to the finite, society is set adrift. Relativism suggests that you can do anything with whomever you wish, wherever you wish to do it. And it's up to you. We've gone so far in relativism that the end result is that we are raising a generation of people who do not know right from wrong. And it is in this context that leaders are called to set an example of what it means to have integrity of consistent belief out of the Judeo-Christian tradition and apply that to the needs and concerns of our time and vote their convictions. There's a terrible tearing of the fabric of character that takes place when we act or speak or vote inconsistent with what are our real convictions. I see it happen when someone decides to take a particular plan of action or votes inconsistent with what he really believes. And then a facsimile, a, a mask falls over, a, a caricature of the real character is presented to the world because the pain of the inconsistency 
cannot be faced. And yet, when that becomes a pattern, soon there's no longer a question. And an examine, unexamined life is no life at all. To fall into the hands of a loving, gracious God is to fall into the demand that we do things His way. When God wants to drill a leader, skill a leader, thrill a leader, when God wants to mold a leader to play the noblest part, when God longs with all his heart to mold so great and bold a leader that all the world will be amazed, watch his methods, watch his ways, how he persistently perfects whom he royally elects how he uses whom he chooses, and with every crisis induces, and with every blessing infuses, to try his splendor out. Our God knows what he's about. When we dare to try out the splendor of God, we realize that he is the eternal person smith and that he's constantly hammering us out to be the people that we were meant to be. And he wants to reproduce in us the very characteristics of the character of our Lord. And what else is the fruit of the Spirit than that? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, and self-control. I love what William Penn said about George Fox. He was God's original and no man's copy. And in a contemporary sense, I love the wonderful thing that a basketball coach said about Kirby Bryan. He said, I want him to be the next Kobe Bryan, not the next Michael Jordan. And God has a very special plan in mind for each of us. And it's when we accept the absolutes of God as the pattern of the development of the character traits that are important that it begins to change our attitude toward our responsibility. Each of us has been placed in the particular place where he or she is because God wants to do something there that no one else can do, and if we won't do it, it won't get done. The eight words of the motto of the chaplaincy are these, without God we can't, and without us he won't. And when we get that clearly set in our minds, then we realize that he is the source of supernatural power to do what we could never do on our own. But he will pour out his power when we dare to seek his will and way. And if I'm seeing anything that's really exciting at this time of history, is that there are senators, senators' spouses, and Senate staff meeting together on a weekly basis in separate groups, but meeting each week for consistent Bible study to allow the plumb line of God's justice and righteousness to fall on the decisions that must be made. I'll never forget the moment in the life of our senator's Bible study when at the end of a message on commitment, I suggested that perhaps there were some of the senators there who might want to make a renewed commitment of their lives and to become riverbeds for the flow of God's power in the decisions that they made. I said, let's just be quiet now before we end our meeting. And if there's anyone who wishes to make this renewed commitment to God, please quietly raise your right hand and we'll all gather around you and pray. 
Well, there was five minutes of silence. And all of a sudden, Connie Mack from Florida shot up his hand and said, I'm ready. And the senators gathered around him and began to pray for him. I asked him three questions. Are you willing to renew your commitment to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Are you willing to commit your work here in government as your ministry for Christ? And thirdly, are you willing to receive supernatural power that you might exercise the gifts of wisdom and knowledge and discernment and prophetic power? To each of the questions he answered, yes, yes, yes. And when he got up from his chair, his face was radiant. And the other senators said, you know, I, I should have been in that chair. And many of them have been. As a matter of fact, we talk about the center of that circle that gathers every Thursday as the power center. And recently, uh, Max Cleland, the senator from Georgia, had a very difficult time with a repeated syndrome of fear that had been troubling him. And he asked for prayer. For 31 years, he thought that it was his grenade that had dropped out of his special belt carrying his grenades and that he had jumped on it in order to save his men and it had blown off his legs and his right hand. For 31 years, he lived with the awful sense that he had been the cause of that accident. And then he went on television after we'd prayed for him. The interviewer asked for an explanation of how he was hurt, and so he explained it. Two days later, a man from Annapolis called and said, Senator, you have it all wrong. That's not how, not how it happened. I was the medic who picked you up. I saw the whole thing. It was not your grenade. It was the grenade of the man behind you. It was his first day out on the field. You were the captain and he was a part of your team. And when he leaped out of the helicopter, he had turned the pins in the grenade and the grenade fell out of his belt, rolled between your legs, out in front of you, and you leaped upon it to save your men. Well, the next time Max came to the senator's Bible study, his face was aglow, and he said, I've been worrying about the wrong thing for 31 years. And we saw the direct implication of an answer to prayer. And it's happened over and over again. After a study of the meaning of faith as a special gift from God, one of the senators went out and sat on a bench. He pulled a big hat down over his eyes so that no one would interrupt him. And he realized that uh, he had primary faith in God, but he didn't have faith to trust God to provide for him in the specific challenges and stresses of leadership in the Senate. After sitting there for an hour, he got up and he said, I'm going to go see the chaplain. Well, it just happened that uh, I had had a 15-minute uh, appointment canceled just before he got to my door. He rapped at the door, I opened the door, and he said, I want that gift of faith. 
and after a few moments we were in prayer together. Afterwards, uh, I turned on the television and he was seated in the chair of the President Pro Tem. And I was amazed at the different look upon his face. The control center of his life had shifted from himself to allowing God to control his life. And it was a radiant upon his face. The next day I saw him and uh, he said, it lasted all night. I saw him a week later and he said, it's still lasting. I was with him last week and uh, he affirmed the fact that a profound transformation had taken place in his life when he began to trust God with the specific decisions and concerns, hopes and hurts of his life. And there's an integrity between what he says and what he does. Integrity flows into what I call intentionality, which is the action of the will in implementing the very things that we believe God has called us to be and do. We have to admit the fact that in America we have the nation that we are willing to tolerate. Many of the changes that need to take place need people who dare to believe that they are called to be change agents in those problems and needs. Anxiety and fear are still rampant in our society. We're still facing the uh, continued demise of the family. The role of fathers in America still is weak. Racism has once again raised its ugly head in American life. And there is a great need for each of us to come to that crucial commitment to apply what we believe to the great needs and concerns of our time in history. But now, if all of that has uh, led you to feel a little bit uncertain and uncomfortable in terms of how can any of us ever live up to all of that, I'd like to suggest that the uh, final step, the deepest step of knowing God, is to become a part of the holy order of the inadequate. We have a special fellowship uh, among senators and some chiefs of staff and some of the employees of the Senate. We call it the holy order of the inadequate. And the acrostic of that uh, leads us to uh, kind of a uh, key word that we uh, say to one another when we see each other. We give a high five and say, Hoy, we're members of the holy order of the inadequate. The wonderful thing about knowing God is that he always presses you out onto an edge. Every time you think you have it all put together, he gives you a challenge bigger and more profound, more exciting than you ever thought you could handle. I've known it all through my life. At the very time I was settled in Hollywood, California, thinking that uh, the rest of my professional life would be easy and a slow saunter downhill, God called me to the chaplaincy and I struggled to stay above water. I believe that uh, the Peter Principle is wrong. I'd like to suggest what I call the Ogilvy Principle, that God is always pushing us beyond where we can use our own talents and human resources to be able to cope. It's so that we will trust him for supernatural power. I see it happening all of the time. I saw it happening during the impeachment trial when we were all forced to stay in our places for a month and a half and uh, senators had an opportunity to get to know each other in a way that watching each other on the television screen never provided. Deeper friendships were formed within parties and then lines of communication between the parties. And I found people 
asking more profound questions about the nature of morality in America than I've ever answered in 45 years of ministry. People would come to my chair on either side, and I kept shifting back and forth so that no one would be able to say that I was partial to either side. But they'd come to the uh, chair, and they would want to talk about the implications of God's absolutes on American society and what we were going to do about that. And some may not be satisfied with the uh, final vote that was taken, but this I can tell you that the United States Senate wrestled with the implications of morality in America. And some of the most vociferous speeches that were made about the nature of the uh, failure in our culture and in our leadership were made by people who dared to follow through on a vote that indicated their convictions. I believe that we come out of all of this with a great need for a profound, far-reaching spiritual awakening in America. And it must begin with each of us. The old prayer, Lord, change my nation, beginning with me, finally becomes the liberating prayer. Can we say that we really know God? Are we spending the time with him that will enable us to know his mind so that the decisions that we make, the values that we develop, the leadership that we give is consistent with his commandments and fulfills his absolutes in a time of history when our society is adrift. And so it finally comes down to a decision that each of us must make. And as we challenge each of our leaders, one after the other, with the responsibility to be moral leaders in our time of history, I want to see the American people to reverse the poles that give a distorted idea that moral values and character don't count in America anymore. I don't know whether you were ever asked questions in those polls. I wasn't. And you know, it's interesting. I haven't been able to find anyone in all my travels across this nation who's ever been called by one of those poll takers. <laughs> it's time to reverse the trend. And it begins with you and me and with great universities like this and with leaders like we have with men and women like Jesse Helms, who dares to vote his convictions and stand for truth. I want to close tonight uh, <coughs> with a uh, poem by my favorite poet. I like it because it was written in times of great need and it came out of a realization of God's supernatural power to face difficult times. Annie Johnson Flint had crippling arthritis. They had to use 12 pillows to prop her up so that she could write. And she wrote with a gnarled hand, but what she wrote was so real. Picture that then as I close. He giveth more grace as the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength 
as the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength is spent ere the day is half done, when we have exhausted our hoarded resources, the Father's full giving has barely begun. His love has no limits. His grace has no measure. His power no limits known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ogilvy. On behalf of the Jesse Helms Center and the whole community, we have a little gift we'd like to give to you to take back to Washington. We have a, a Tom Clark gnome with, as a product of North Carolina. It's Pastor Peterson. So you can take that along with various products from throughout the state. But Thank you again. It was wonderful. Thank you for coming. Good night.